Uh, good morning and welcome back. This is a real treat for us. In our industry, there are average professors, um, and we have a, every school has a lot of those that um, were the bomb on FASB rules in 1978 and are still here. Uh, and then there are good professors, there are great professors, and then there's Aswak de Motorin, who kind of sets the bar, uh, not only here at the business school, but across graduate education and is consistently named one of the best professors in the world. Here at the Stern School, we have 190 faculty members, and each year the students select one professor who they feel is most inspiring in the classroom. Sonia Marciano, who you heard from yesterday, has done um, something that's really unusual. She's won twice. Uh, Aswat de Motoran has won nine times, uh, which, uh, for those of you who uh, understand statistics, is impossible. <laughs> So uh, Aswat's literally written the book on valuation and uh, is probably one of the dozen people in the world that can actually move markets. And when he goes on television or uh, in front of media and makes a comment about a specific stock, the stock responds. Anyways, with that, Professor DeMotorin. Thank you, Scott. I am lucky enough or unlucky enough to teach almost every single class that I teach in this room. This is, I, last semester I was counting, and I've taught 1,380-minute sessions in this room. And I'd love to tell you I like this room. I absolutely detest this room. Okay? <laughs> it's got the ambiance of a Madison Square Garden on the day the Knicks are losing by 20 points, okay? <laughs> which is almost every single time they play. So it's a... It, it's not a great room, so I hope you're able to kind of stay in your seat at least for the next uh, whatever amount of time you're sitting here. But um, 30 minutes to me is like the time I get to get warmed up, so I should probably get started, otherwise I'll just keep wandering. So what I'd like to talk a little bit about today is the value of a user. Right? Let, me set the, let, let me set the, um, the, the table. A few weeks ago, probably about four weeks ago, I did my fourth annual valuation of Uber. Okay? It's a company I got obsessed with in, I, if, to, be, to be honest, I'd never heard of Uber in June of 2014. It, it shows you how much I live on the subway. I never take cabs. I never take car service. So in June of 2014, I saw a Wall Street Journal article that said Uber had raised money from venture capitalists who priced the company at $17 billion. Notice the word I used. I used the word price the company at, as opposed to what? Valued. Never use the word value and VC in the same sentence. <laughs> VCs can't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it. They can price everything. The difference between valuing and pricing is valuing, you've got to understand the business, build up to the cash flows, come up with the value. Pricing, what do you do? You look at what other people are paying for similar companies based on some metric, subscribers, users, revenue, and you attach a price to the company. Price of 17 billion. And I was a little puzzled. I was a little puzzled because it's a company I'd never heard of, 17 billion, so what do they do? I'll take that back. I'd actually heard the word Uber or seen the word Uber on my credit card statements in the previous three months leading into June of 2014. Turned out that my uh, second son, who was going to college in North Carolina, was using Uber and using my credit card. I don't know how that happened. You know? But I thought he was taking German language classes, to be quite honest, right? <laughs> the no umlaut on the U should have kind of given it away. But uh, I, I did my first valuation of Uber in June of 2014. I re revisited them 2015, 2016, 2017. And essentially, I tried my best to make my best judgments on what Uber would do. So this is my 2017 valuation of Uber. I won't go through the details, but essentially I started off by telling a story about the company. I'm big on telling stories. You can't value a company without a story. A story about a logistics company with global ambitions that essentially would eventually succeed. This is after Travis had left the company. So this was in that period of chaos where either people were completely giving up on the company or saying, hey, it's coming back from the dead. I thought I was being pretty optimistic. I came up with a value of about 36 billion, building up revenues, margins, doing all the stuff that you normally do to value a young startup that you think will succeed. So I put my valuation out, and 
One of the things about valuing Silicon Valley companies is people in Silicon Valley absolutely hate it when you do that. Their response is, how dare you? How dare you value one of ours? Okay. So I get the usual response from, I don't like your revenue number, you got to miss this. And so much of it was about you could have got the inputs wrong, as if I didn't know that already. But one of the responses I got from somebody I respected fairly, you know, I've known a long time, was you're missing the point. This is not the way you should be valuing a company like Uber. You should really be valuing the company by building up from its users. And he had a point, because if you think about it, we're increasingly a world where businesses are judged by numbers. Numbers of members, numbers of subscribers, numbers of users. Think about the largest market cap companies in the world. When you think Facebook, you think 1.9 billion users. When you think Apple, you think about more than a billion people carrying smartphones. When you think about Google, you think about the number of people visiting not just the search engine, but YouTube. When you think about Netflix, in fact, the number that, that caused markets to kind of to push the price up 10% was the fact that they added 4 million subscribers and went above 100 million. We think in terms of users, subscribers, customers, and it's not just the new economy companies. If you think about Microsoft, increasingly they're judging themselves on how many members they're adding to Office 365. If you're investing in Adobe, it's about how many people have signed up to Creative Cloud. So the, the point he was making was you have to start thinking about valuation, not from the top down, which is the way we've traditionally thought about valuation, but you have to think about it from the bottom up. But he actually went further. He said this, this, this DCF, which, which is the, the way it's used in Silicon Valley is as an insult. You do DCF. The way they actually say it even is, you, know, you can't use a DCF to value a company based on users. I said, really? So about three weeks ago, I decided to, to think about how you would value a company if you decided to value it based on users. Let me set the table. Let's start with the first principle. That's going to be true whether you're thinking about users, top down, bottom up. The value of a business is a function of its cash flows, growth, and risk. You can't change that no matter what perspective you take about the company. The difference here is whether you want to value a company on an aggregated basis, which is you take the total revenues, the, minus the total, which is the way we traditionally do valuation, or whether you want to value a company on a disaggregated basis. This is not new. In fact, there's this way of valuing companies called some of the parts valuation. So if you gave me a company like United Technologies, I could value the whole company as an, as a, as in a valuation. Or I can take each of its six businesses and value each business and add them all up. You could give me a multinational company, and I could take geographical areas, and I could value each geographical area separately, add them all up, and come up with a value for the company. Or if you gave me a user-based company, presumably I could value a user and aggregate those users to come up with a value for a company. So if you think about why we don't usually do that, it is not because we don't know how to do it, but because we don't have the information that we need to value companies on a disaggregated basis. And you're going to see this. As I present to you how I would value a company on a user basis, you're going to see me desperately try to make up numbers as I'm going along. Not because I feel the urge to make it up, but because the numbers are not given to me. But essentially, I have a platform where if you can give me the information, I can value a user for you. Not just an existing user, but a new user. So let's set the process up. You come to me with a user-based company, and you can pick your favorite company, Blue Apron, if you want. I just threw that in there to kind of depress you, eh? <laughs> in case you invest in the company. But essentially, my point is we talk about users casually. We talk about users as if all users are made equal. But I want you to think about an Amazon Prime member, a Netflix subscriber, a Facebook user, and start thinking about, as I present you with this platform, what would drive the value of a user? And if you think about the value of a user-based company, you can actually value the company in three slices. The first is the existing users you have and how much value you attach to them. The second slice is new users you might acquire in the future and how much value you attach to them. And the third is whether you like it or not, there is this corporate drag. Not, not necessarily not, you know, expenses you don't have to make, but these are the expenses of running a business. So it's going to be the value of existing users plus the value of new users minus that corporate drag. So let's start 
with the first of those pieces. If you ask me to value an existing user, and I'd like to set the framework up, and as I set the framework up, again, think about different businesses. Here's the first thing I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at what you make or don't make on an existing user. What do you make as revenues per user? What do you make, what do you spend to service those revenues? So that's what you make. And you could right now be losing money on a user because you want to kind of to cultivate them to make money in the future. So you're going to start off with that as your starting point. Over time, presumably your revenues will grow from these users, so that's an input that I need. How long? Well, that depends on how sticky your users are. Already we're throwing in words which are going to matter in my valuation. A user who's going to stay on for 20 years is worth a lot more than a user that's going to be gone in six months or a year. So depending on how long I think the user will last, I build your revenues up. So the renewal rates matter because they will drive the value of an existing user. Now, some revenue models are more predictable than others. We talked about a Netflix user versus an Amazon Prime user. The value of a Netflix user, the revenues come from subscription revenues, much more predictable than revenues from a transaction-based model, which is what Prime is, right? Because unless you buy stuff on Amazon, outside of the $99, they're not making money off you. And Uber users are all transactions. You could be an Uber user, but if you never hit that app, I make no money off you. So the business model you adopt will affect how predictable those revenues are. And from a valuation perspective, it's going to show up in what discount rate I apply to what, how much. So if you think about what drives the value of a user, almost everything you, you think about in a user-based company is somewhere in that existing user model. Because your user stickiness and loyalty will drive the life of a user. How much you make per user right now will, drive, will become your starting point. How much more you can sell to that user will drive your growth rate. And if I can value all of those, I can come up with the value of an existing user. Now, if I get the value of an existing user, you're saying, what's the value of a new user? First, is the value of a new user going to be greater than or less than the value of an existing user? Well, you got to, first, you've got to acquire that new user. So the cost of acquiring that new user will now have to get built into my model. So if you ask me what's the value of a new user, I'm going to take the value of an existing user that I already have built up, and then I'm going to have to estimate how much it costs you to acquire a new user. And if you can acquire new users at low cost, clearly they're worth more than at a high cost. But here there might be a trade-off. Because if you think about the total value of new users, it's the number of new users you get times the value of a new user. So you might decide that you're willing to spend more to acquire new users if you can get more new users. Obviously, you'd like the best of both worlds. Acquire a lot of new users and acquire them at a low cost, but you might have to spend more to acquire that, that larger number. So if you think about the value of a new user, everything we think about in terms of driving the value of these businesses is going to sh show somewhere again in the inputs. And the corporate expense drag, of course, is the fact that to run this business, there will be some core expenses that you cannot attach to the users. They're basically corporate expenses. I can't just ignore them, because my value as a company is going to be a function of how much those expenses are and what I would value those expenses at. So ready, let's try this on Uber, because that was my intent. As I said, I'm going to try to value how much a user is worth at Uber and how much, both an existing and a new user. And as I go through this, as again, think about the platform, because I'd like you to think about applying this to any other company. So we have a problem with, you, with Uber to begin with. It's a private company. So getting to its financials, it's like getting to a CIA secret, you know, it's, it's almost, it, much of the data you have is either leaked data. In fact, until 2016, you really did not have any financials. 2016's financials were leaked, which already makes you a little pause a little bit about whether you can trust them. But to the extent that they were leaked, here's what Business Week, I think, or, or Bloomberg reported as their numbers from 2016. They had revenues of six and a half billion, and then an operating loss of 2.8 billion. It's kind of minimalist information. But if you trust them on those numbers, in 2016, they made $6.5 billion in revenues and had $2.8 billion in operating losses, which means their expenses were $9.3 billion. So I started my experimentation to figure out how much they were spending, because that $9.3 billion includes both the cost of servicing existing users and the cost of acquiring new users. Already you can see why 
accounting is failing us on these companies. Because if you started a manufacturing company 30 years ago, the cost of servicing existing users was shown as operating expenses, but the cost of going out and getting growth was shown as a capital expenditure, right, in the balance sheet. Already you can see why when you look at a technology company, especially a young technology company losing money, it's much more difficult to draw conclusions about whether they're truly losing money or whether they're spending money to acquire future growth. So I tried to, using their numbers, I tried to figure out how much they were spending on existing users and how much they were spending getting new users. So you might not like what I did, but here's what I did. I took the increase in number of users in 2016, which I knew. They increased the number of users by 16 million in 2016. I took the expenses of adding new users by backing out from the, I broke the 9.3 billion down into how much were corporate expenses, which I could kind of figure out from their GNA, how much were the costs of servicing existing members, and how much were new users. And I estimated that it cost Uber about $239 per user to acquire new users in 2016. And I estimated that they, when you looked at the expenses, that, that of, of their overall expenses, the operating expenses that they were getting per user, but 69% of every dollar they were getting in revenues was going to service existing users. So I have my starting point. So here was my first try. To value an existing user, here I took those starting numbers. Again, built off those very, very limited leak numbers, and I, applied a 12% growth rate in revenue. So what I'm talking about here is if you're a user at Uber, I'm projecting that Uber is going to find a way to get you to spend about 12% more every year. And I gave them a, a, a user life of about 15 years, which I think is pretty optimistic, with a very high renew. So basically, I'm tr bending over backwards to try to figure out how much a user is worth. So with a 15-year life, with a lot of users continuing to keep the app on their phones. Because renewal here basically means you just keep the app. You don't delete me. It turns out that the value that I get per existing user is $410 million a user. I'm sorry, $410. They'd love it to be $410 million. <laughs> $410 per user. There were about 40 million existing users. The value that I would attach to their existing users is about $16.4 billion. I'm building off a lot of assumptions, but those assumptions are coming from the existing numbers because I'm trying to guess how much of the 9.3 billion is coming from service. I would hope that Uber knows what the actual breakdown is because inside a company, you should have this, these numbers. You might not reveal them to me, but if you're working in a user-based company, doing this should be part of the process of you building up to the value of your company and figuring out where to direct your resources. To get the value of a new user, I took those existing users. I made assumptions about how many additional, and so basically I'm assuming that over the next 10 years, Uber will quadruple its user, user base from 40 million to 164 million, continuing to spend $238 per user growing at the inflation rate, but I also factored in that my existing user is worth 410. So the value my new users added over time is about 20.2 billion. So 16.2 billion from existing users, 20.1 billion from new users. The last item, of course, is a negative because they have these expenses that have no place to go. Their expenses associated with running Uber as a company, that's a $10.6 billion drag. If I bring them all together, the value that I get for Uber as a company is about 37.2 billion. It's actually 26 billion for their existing assets but they're five billion in cash, which I'm guessing, because that's seven billion two months ago, but the way they burn through cash, that might be one billion by now, I have no idea, right? So I'd love to call their bank and say, how much money does Uber have in their checking account, but I don't think I'll get an answer. So I'm guessing it's five billion. You know what the other six billion is? Last year, Uber removed itself from the Chinese market. It did it because it was leaking so much money that it decided it couldn't afford to stay there. And in return for leaving, Didi Chuk Singh gave them to, you know, a slice of Didi China. That slice is worth six billion. So you add them all up, the value that I get is 37 billion. So I said, look, you know, I can value Uber based on the, so when I put this out, they said, all these are guess, guesses. Of course they're guesses. The numbers that I'm basing it on are, are what I can observe and I can't see much. And, I'll, and if you think that it's going to get better when Uber gets 
goes public, you're missing the point because public companies don't have to provide the user-based information we need to value these companies. And the, so if I were writing, I mean, I, every year I send these suggestions to the Financial Accounting Standards Board. They keep ignoring me. Because <laughs> they keep getting caught up in these writing rules about things that nobody cares about. If I were writing rules on disclosure, these are the rules I would write for investors in these companies. I need to know more specifics about your users. I need to know how many of your users cancel their subscriptions every year. I need to know specifics about users, not because I'm just curious, but because if I want to value a company in a user base, base I know what information I need. Now, I, I know I don't have very much time, but let me, hit, let me hit a few points using this framework. When, it, when you see a company like Uber lose money, when they had that $2.8 billion, that was a headline. Uber loses $2.8 billion. People react one of two ways. The optimist said, hey, it doesn't matter if you lose money, which is absurd. Of course it matters if you lose money. And the pessimist said, it means our Uber is worth nothing. The pessimists, of course, are the ones who would never buy a young company, because to them, young companies are always worth nothing because they lose money. So I'm going to make a statement that's going to sound absurd. If a company loses money, there are good ways to lose money and bad ways to lose money. Let me talk about the good ways to lose money. If you're looking at a company with losses, I'd much rather that those losses come from you spending money to acquire new customers than servicing existing users. That makes sense? In fact, I took my Uber numbers and said, look, I guessed how much was going, but what if the numbers had been different? The greater the percentage of Uber's expenses that come from acquiring a new user, the more the value of the company is. In fact, the value of the company increases to 51 billion if most of their or all of their expenses come from acquiring new users. Next time you see a money losing company, you want to stop and ask, is it losing money because it's servicing existing members or existing users, or is it going after new users? Here's a second. I'd like to know how much of your costs are fixed and variable. And I'm not talking some accounting distinction. Variable expenses are expenses that go, grow with your revenues. Fixed expenses are expenses that don't grow with your revenues. This is where economies of scale kick in. If your expenses keep growing at the same rate as revenues, you're in deep trouble because if you're losing money, you will, it's just math doesn't work for you. So I'd like to know how much of your expenses are fixed and how much are variable. So if you're asking questions about money losing companies, you'd start with that. Here's the other thing that I find this platform useful for thinking about. A lot of buzzwords around us, especially with technology now, right? Networking benefits, big data. And I can go through the list, but I would argue that with this platform, we can start to get specific about why they matter. I'm going to show you a picture that kind of brings, brings home this. Oh, before I do that, when you talk about growth, there are good ways to grow and bad ways to grow. I'd much rather that you grow by selling more to your existing subscribers. That growth is worth a lot more than growing by going out and adding new users. Having more intense existing subscribers is worth more than adding new users, simply because with new users, you have that user cost, the cost of acquiring a new user against it. And it does matter what these models are. So let me use this platform to talk a little bit about the buzzwords. To me, here is the perfect way to think about a user-based company. You can have you, companies with lots of users that are worth nothing. You can have companies with a lot of users that are worth incredibly large amounts. So it's going to sound incredibly simplistic, but user-based companies that are worth a lot have found a magic combination. They get a high value per user, and they have a low cost of acquiring users. You see why that's uncommon? Because if you have low cost of acquiring users, and everybody has low cost acquiring users, what's going to happen in this business? Competition is going to come in. So you've somehow got to find a way that you get high value per user, but your costs are low. But everybody else in the business has either high costs of acquiring users or low value. Here's where the networking benefits and big data come in. What's the definition of networking benefits? It gets easier to grow as you get bigger, right? That's my, my, my definition of networking benefits, is as you get bigger, it gets easier for you to grow because for some reason, you become a more attractive place for customers to go. You know what that tells me in this model? As you get bigger, what's happening to your cost of adding new users? It's actually getting lower. So if you can get networking benefits to work for you, you can bring your cost of acquiring new users down, whereas your competition is high cost acquiring users. 
Now let's talk about big data. Again, used very fuzzily. But if you think about big data, what are you doing? You're acquiring data on your existing users. Why? Not because you love data. I hope that's not the reason. But because you want to use the data to sell them more. It shows up as higher revenue growth. If you can get that magic combination of networking benefits pushing your cost down and the fact that you can sell more to your customers with big data, you've got the magic combination to becoming a valuable company. I already talked about revenue models and how they play up. There's a trade-off here. If you look at subscription-based models, the power of subscription-based models is that they give you more stable revenues. The power of transaction-based models is you can sell the growth you can get from existing users is much higher because you can sell them more stuff. And the power of an advertising-based model is you can show high growth very early in your life because it doesn't cost you very much to acquire users. If you ask me what's the right model for me as a company, I can't answer without knowing where you are in the life cycle, what kind of business you're There is no dominant model here. But in any, for any company, there is a dominant model. And I'm going to close off with one final thought about real options. This is a word we throw around. One of the reasons it's nice to have an intense user base that is attached to you is you might find ways to sell them. You haven't even thought about this yet, but other things in the future. That's what a real option is. Again, with a user-based model, you can attach the value of that real option to how intense those users are you have and how much time you have. There's a reason why Facebook has the wondrous valuation that it does. It has the numbers, 1.9 billion. It has the intensity. They spend an hour every day. And even if they haven't figured out what to do with you yet, if you're a Facebook user, think of all the things they could come up with in the future that they could try to sell you over that one hour time period. There is an incredible real option value in here. So as you think about Netflix or Amazon or any other user-based company, start thinking about these specifics. And perhaps we can then figure out why users at some companies are worth a lot more. Why is a Twitter user worth so much less than a Facebook user? Why is an Amazon Prime member worth so much more than a Costco member? So in a sense, you can start describing why values can be different across different companies by setting up the platform for thinking about the value of a new user is. It's something I'm planning to spend the rest of my summer on. Essentially, each week I'm going to take, I do only one company a week. I'm too lazy. So I'll take, you know, next week I want to spend on Amazon. What's the value of a prime member to Amazon? Uh, because increasingly, that's the way I want to think about companies, because it gives me a, that, that lever to think about why values are different. So I, I'm, I've been told to to direct you elsewhere. So let me see if I can find that page. Uh, that's Ross, before we cut everyone loose, yeah. uh, just a couple questions. Um, have you valued Snapchat? Yep. <laughs> I, 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 Sna the good side about Snapchat is that their users are intense, much more intense than a Twitter user is. The, bad, the problem for Snapchat is they're competing in a space where there are two giants who suck up all the oxygen, right. Facebook and Google, which means for them to succeed, they've got to find a niche. They can't be all things to everybody. They've got to find a niche. And when I valued Snapchat at the time of their IPO, I, I, I thought I was being pretty optimistic in my numbers. The value I got was about $11 per share. But the reason I had to hold back was I said, even if you're successful, you're going to be a niche advertising company. Mm -hmm. And as a niche advertising company, I don't see a value being greater than $11 per share. Maybe there's a way in which they can break out. But I think given the competition that they get from just Google and Facebook, it's going to be really tough to do. And when you look across the ecosystem, a Netflix subscriber, a prime household, a Facebook um, user. user, give us just a quick order of most valuable to least valuable. A Netflix subscriber is the most predictable revenues, but the lowest revenue growth per user. Because if you're a user, Netflix can't come back and say, this year it's going to be 200. So it's got low, grow, low growth per user. That's a downside, but very predictable revenues because every month you pay that $10 or whatever you're paying. An Amazon user Prime member is potentially has the highest option value because, in a sense, Amazon has 70 million members, and they're lining up everything but the kitchen sink to try to sell you, right? So if you, look at whole, if, you, so if you look at the Whole Foods acquisition, that's the way I see it, is it's another way in which they can pump up the value of a prime member by selling you stuff you wouldn't have bought otherwise. You know? 
And a Facebook user, I think, just the sheer numbers. I think per user, the value might be lower, but you're multiplying by 1.9 billion. And if Mark Zuckerberg has his way, that could be 3 billion. So I think for Facebook, it's the numbers that drive the value. With Amazon, it's a potential for what they can do with you. And with Netflix, it's just the sheer predictability of those revenues because turning off a subscription is an act that people take don't take easily. So it's much more predictable and much more long term. So each has a strength. So within each business, though, you can compare why a Netflix subscriber is worth more than a Pandora subscriber. And you can start thinking about what divides them. Yeah, and that's why I think within each, if you compare across, you can start to see why a value of a user can vary even within the same space. So two more questions. So when Aswath announces on his blog or in media that he's in the midst of a valuation of a company, that company's IR department literally holds its breath until that number comes out from Aswath. When you look, so look, looking across the new economy ecosystem and all the names, Snap at 11 bucks came out at 20, 20. Went to 28, now it's at 15 or whatever. I would imagine a lot of your valuations are coming in south of where they are now. Can you give us, of the names that everyone talks about, the, the company you have valued that is your number was most dramatically below where it is? And are there any where your valuations were dramatically above? Who, what are the most under and overvalued companies in the world right now, according to your methodology? The, the nature of markets with these companies is a manic depressive, mm -hmm. which is when they're optimistic, they're way too optimistic. When they're pessimistic, they sell off. So I remember when I, you know, with Facebook, when, they, when it went public, I didn't buy it, but I did buy it three months later after its first annual report, which struck me as incredibly crazy that after one annual report, you're willing to reassess the entire future of a company. And the analogy I would give, it's like your kindergartner coming back with a report card and you taking a look and saying, you're not going to college. <laughs> Perhaps you're overreacting, right? And so I bought Facebook at 18. That was my good moment. The bad moment was I sold too early. But I have to stay consistent with what brought me to the dance, which is I buy something when it's cheaper. I will buy Snap one of these days. And I'm convinced. So to me, it's, it's a continuum. The game doesn't end. And that's why yeah. I keep revisiting these valuations. It's at the right price. I'd love to have Uber in my portfolio. I think yeah. it's changing the world. At the wrong price, I'm not interested. But I would say that about any of these companies, is watch them over time. Don't give up on them, because to the extent that there is, there is value in this company, there will be a time where they're selling at the right price. OK, so again, what's most wrong and what's most right out there? I find, I, I, I think Netflix, I think, is, get, is close to what I think it should be at in terms of, in, because I think people are reflecting the fact that the way we get entertainment has changed, and Netflix is at the yeah. forefront. Amazon, I find tough to get to the value that you need to because so much has to go right. Yep. Okay. And I've loved that. I mean, I've, I've bought Amazon four times and sold Amazon four times in the last 20 years, which tells me where I am, which tells you where I am right now. Yeah. But I think so much has to go right that I'm reluctant to buy at the prices that they're trading at right now. In fact, okay. they've got to become so dominant in this space for me to make money. Well, we've been huge Amazon bears the entire conference, so that's good to hear. Um, a lot of people in the room, last question, are thinking about they have, tr a lot of people in the room have business models where they spend a lot of money on brand awareness and right. equity building, and then uh, it's transactional model. They go into a point of distribution and buy the product at high margin. Do you think, and a lot of companies are thinking about, they, they have kind of software envy and recurring revenue envy, and they're, they're thinking about subscription models. Do you think it makes sense for a lot of the brands in the room to really explore moving to a different economic model? No, one of the reasons I put up all three is there's a trade-off. A subscription-based model will give you more predictable revenues but lower growth. So the mm -hmm. companies which will lose by going to a subscription-based model are the ones that would have gained by having a transaction-based model where potential mm -hmm. growth would be high. So it really depends on where you are in the life cycle and what your users think about you. So I think some companies will lose money by going to a subscription-based model or lose value because mm -hmm. they've traded off more predictable revenues for revenues where they could potentially get higher growth. So I'm not sure a subscription model is right for a lot of companies because I think that the transactions are where the value might come from. So even within Microsoft, I think the jury is still out as to whether Office 365 will deliver more value for them in the long term than the old model of, hey, let's come out with a new Office update every two years or three years and make people buy. 
And I think what tips the balance is whether you are, you're the only game in town, which is what Microsoft was for a long time, mm -hmm. or whether you're competing in a space where people are looking at other ways of doing spreadsheets, Word, et cetera, because they're working on the tablets. So I think what tipped the scale here was the shifting away from desktops and Microsoft. Great. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome.